Hello everyone, today is Thursday, July 13, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Of course, and as usual, I want to thank you for being here. I'm humbled by your presence. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, let's talk about current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. Hold off on your stock picks if you don't mind until we get to the charts. And once we do get there, once I open it up for picks, just ask about one stock at a time and hit return. You can ask about as many stocks as you want, and I'll stay here as long as possible. Obviously, there's a time limit on the recordings and such. But I'll stay here as long as possible. And we don't have uh, a huge crowd today. I think a few people forgot that I was doing the show. So we should have time to get to all of them. But uh, that's for your benefit. Just to type one symbol in and hit return. And that way I know whether I covered it or not. This week's focus is going to be surviving a drawdown. And we'll get into that in a lot of details in just one second. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I know a zip past that, but you can always, if you get really bored, go to my website and check that out. Uh, if you've ever read one of those, it's kind of interesting. A lot of uh, interesting facts in there, such as uh, if you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast, things like that. So Now, before we talk about drawdown, I got to think it maybe be a good idea to define drawdown. So... I poked around on the internet. I actually found an article of mine going back about 15 years, maybe even a little longer, which is scary. <laughs> and in the article, and I'm not sure where the definition came from, but I had defined drawdown is the amount of money you lose trading expressed as a percentage of your total equity. And then obviously, if all your trades were profitable, you never would experience a drawdown. Now, drawdown doesn't have anything to do with your overall performance. It's only the money that you lose while achieving that performance. And its calculation begins only with a losing trade and continues as long as the account hits new equity lows. Now, I know this is kind of a little rudimentary here, but this is from the base videos on uh, trading full circle, which are free the base videos, at least on my website, and I'd encourage you to, to watch those. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves of these utmost basics. So let's say you lose 10%, and then you make back 10%, then you broke an even, right? Well, not exactly. You obviously have to make back a little bit more than 10%. And the math on that is such, and the reason is 10% gain on the remainder of your account, which is $90,000, if you start with $100,000, of course, would only bring you back to $99,000. So you'd have to make a little bit more. And then obviously, it grows geometrically from there. So obviously, anyone, everyone here has been trading for a while, so you know this. But just in case somebody new to trading is watching, obviously a 50% loss, if you lose half your account, you have to make 100% back just to get the back to break even. And then as you look at this drawdown chart, you could see that it obviously begins to grow geometrically from there. So this is why trading is so unfair because the more you lose, the more you have to make back, or you have to make back much more than you lose, obviously, to get to break even. All right, so we all know what a drawdown is, right? Well, one thing to remember is, and this could be a very lonely sport, as you guys and girls know, and you do feel lonely when you're in a drawdown, but everybody has them. Just like everybody has bodily functions, everybody has drawdowns. And no one is immune. And I'm friends with people who run millions and millions of dollars and hundreds of millions of dollars and even billions of dollars. And guess what? They have drawdowns too. In fact, I think, I think the only person in history without a drawdown was Bernie Madoff, and that was what tipped off the feds eventually. And you do have to watch the slimy marketers out there because they might say something like make 2 to 4% every day. And this is an email that I received 
And as I've said before, and talked a little bit about in those base videos, is that if you had a $10,000 account and you were making 2 to 4% a day, and you did it religiously, by the end of the year, it could be worth as much as $181 million. Now, I love you guys, and I love what I do, and I have a blast doing this. But if I could turn $10,000 into $181 million after by the end of the year, eh, you might not see my fat ass again. So obviously that's complete and utter bullshit. So don't get stressed out by some sort of inflated claims. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here because you guys have been trading for a while and you know these things. But sometimes it's hard, especially when you're new to trading. You feel like someone else has the answer. And I don't want to digress too far, but I've seen some people have some incredible streaks over the years and think, wow, I think they, they might be really on to something. And then I see them go through a pretty horrible drawdown. And I'm not being shot in Friday, but it makes me think that, okay, well, no one has a holy grail and no one is immune. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves of these things. Now, in more recent years, I've been wrapping my head around a concept that I never really thought about. And that concept is you're always in a drawdown, or at least a micro drawdown. You might not be in a drawdown as per the definition of a drawdown. You might not be hitting those new equity lows as measured from your equity highs, like we just talked about in the definition. But you could be drawing down to some of those open profits. And all of this is completely normal. And in fact, more often than not, the odds are pretty good you're not feeling too good about your trades right now. Now, this research comes from Robert Gray, and he once said, I'm sorry, Robert Frey. Robert Gray is a... Um, He's a guitar player, isn't he? He's kind of bluesy guy or rock bluesy. Robert Frey is the ex-hedge fund manager. And he had an interesting YouTube that one of my clients was kind enough to send to me. And you could, you could do a YouTube one and watch the same one. It's pretty interesting. And he said that you spend 75% of your time in a state of regret. Well, regret and drawdown can be used interchangeably because the markets are going against you at least 75% of the time and you'll feel like you're in a state of regret. Robert, Robert Cray. Okay, Robert Cray is a rocker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Black guy, really good on guitar. Yeah, uh, Whatever became of him, I have to I have to add him to my um, Pandora or my um, Napster account. So anyway, Robert Frey said you spend seventy five percent of your time in a state of regret. Now I was listening to a web not a webinar, but watching a speech from my friend Greg Morris. And this is also in his book, Investing with the Trend. And he said markets only make new highs 4% of the time. So I found that quite interesting. So the rest of the time, if you think about it, a market is backing and filling. So this inspired me, and some of you may seen, have seen this slide before. But this inspired me to write a little indicator that would say, okay, I want this indicator to be green when the stock is making new highs, and I want it to be red when it's not making new highs. And what I did was I took the biggest winner in the portfolio so far this year, and hopefully we have some more of these. I know I just said hope. And I thought it'd be interesting to look at the best trade we had and look at how even on the best trades, psychologically, you might not be feeling great about them. So you could see that 
there's a lot of red in here and not very much green. So only on these days where it's green or you're making a new equity high and the other time, the rest of the time, you're losing money on a trade. Now, I would love to have every trade look as good as this, but even if I did, a lot of the time, I would be losing money on the trade or certainly losing open profits. So it comes with the territory. It's something that you're going to have to embrace and live with. Now, let's talk about drawdown recovery. The first thing I would tell you to do is, as usual, continue to follow the plan. You want to see open positions to their fruition. As I preach, and as Sakota is saying, one big winner pays for them all. Now, if you go back earlier this year, I did a few weeks of follow-up on this, and I thought this week would kind of dovetail into what we're talking about. And I talked about moron following a methodology. It's the hardest, easiest thing you ever do because a lot of times you're not doing anything. And what happened back in February was the open portfolio was looking pretty lame, quite frankly. And there was just a tiny little open profit in the open portfolio. And then some clients emailed me and said, Dave, why don't we just shut her down before these open profits evaporate and before these open losses get worse? And it's always hard because sometimes that might be the thing to do, just quit. Unfortunately, you should not quit because you never know if one of these positions might turn into your big winner. Now, again, as Sakota is saying, you get a whip and I get a saw, one good trend pays for them all. We actually invited Sakota, as I said before, to one of our meetings for the AAPTA, which is not Alcoholic Anonymous, but American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, and he came in and played his little banjo and sang us the whipsaw song, and it was kind of fun. We sung along. So the point is you want to see your positions to their fruition because you never know what's going to happen. Now, I had no idea when I started this series on following through on the portfolio that it would work out. But, of course, either way I had a lesson, you know. <laughs> I could say, well, sometimes it doesn't work out. But fortunately, at least based on the open portfolio, now we've had quite a few stinkers in there in between. We had some drawdown. That's why we're talking about drawdowns today. FYI. <laughs> Reminds me of one of my mother-in-law's friends when she first got the Internet. She was sending me all this crap and, like, uh, you know, people hiding under cars at Walmart and cutting your ankles. You know, it's like. I tried to explain to her Snopes and stuff, and I used the term FYI. She's like, FYI? What does that mean? She thought I was, like, telling her to F off. <laughs> I guess I guess my tone I was. I, I, I didn't need to hear that. Um, anyway, where am I going with this? Oh, so if you go back to the February portfolio, you can see that it was on the cusp of going negative. And then as of last night, the same portfolio. Now, everything in white here has already stopped out, okay? So this is not following through with every trade since then. This is just following through that one portfolio. And in this case, we actually took partial profits. But you can see that things have improved tremendously from where they were just by following through. Now, this is on a hypothetical 100K account, just to put it in perspective. And the other thing I want you to see in this is that if you look at this one open trade, and look at the open profits, it turns out to be a fantastic example of one big winner pays for them all. So as we talked in prior weeks, so far, we're able to say bye, Felicia, on that.
Now, when it comes to a drawdown, if you find yourself in a hole, you might want to stop digging. Take a deep breath, and then first thing you want to do is you want to identify what's changed, if anything. Has the market become choppy? Now, one thing I was thinking about right before we got started, and I was actually thinking about this recently, too, in, in finishing up these Trading Full Circle videos, is as a trend follower, you won't really recognize that the market has become choppy until... It's been choppy for a while, okay? You're always going to be a little late. You're always going to overstay your welcome. And in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, you'll be a little late to the game. That's, what, that's why it's called trend following. You're following, okay? So you need to ask yourself, has the market become choppy? And in asking that question, I like to look at a couple thousand stocks every night. So do that if, you, if time allows. Or at the least, look at as many sectors as you can and look at some ETFs or whatever. And then at the least, least take a look at the indices and see what the net net changes. That's something that I beat the dead horse on all the time, the net net. And we have a smaller crowd here today. But usually if we have a bit of a larger crowd, especially if with some people newer to trading, they'll ask about a stock that looks something like this. Well, on a net-net basis, it might not have gone anywhere for months, okay? Yeah, it might have been in a prior uptrend, but in many cases, the net-net is unchanged, or a lot of times it's negative. So go through, look at the indices, look at the net-net change, okay? Russell 2000, where's the Russell 2000? I don't know the exact number. One IWM is what? One something? 140 something, whatever. Where was it a year ago? 140 something. We'll, we'll get those right numbers in a minute. So you need to ask yourself, has the market become choppy? And again, as a trend follower, you're going to trade into those choppy trends. It happens. It happens to everyone. And of course, you can ask yourself, is it just bad luck? Now, the problem with the bad luck thing is we as humans, and I read this in one of the behavioral finance books, and as I've said quite a bit, it's like I started digging into all these behavioral finance books, and after about the third one, they all seem to say the same thing. So I'm going to take the big stack of them that I have, and uh, i got to find them now. My wife cleaned my office. Greg was actually visiting. Greg Morris was visiting a while back and she came in here and cleaned up this mess and she, she put them all in a bookshelf so I got to dig them all out and figure out what difference if any are there between them all. So that's the only problem with these behavior finance books. They all tend to sound the same if you want to start reading them. I think the first one I read was Montier which was pretty good. He had a lot of uh, fundamental analysis stuff in there. He threw in as logic and that I really disagreed with but for the most part, it was pretty good. And that's why I'm always quoting him, giving him, giving him credit, because he was the first one I read. Um, but let me know if there's one you want to read. I'll see if I can dig it out, see if I've read it or not. And I plan to go through them all at some point in time. Anyway, I'm beginning to digress here. But if you do read these behavioral science books, they point out that we as humans, they point out a lot of flaws in the human race. And there's a lot, there's other books that that talk a lot about that too and I'm trying to look at my bookshelf I mean here's one I even have, I hadn't read yet so maybe I should recommend it let me go grab it The Upside of Irrationality and this is one that I plan on reading at some point in time so not necessarily one of the tangents that I'm going to go off on is not necessarily a full-blown behavioral science, science tangent, but I do plan at some point I want to study the flaws of 
humans. And then, wow, Dave, I want to party with you. <laughs> um, but there's, I got quite a few of these books here that I haven't gotten around to reading yet that I'm looking forward to reading when it comes to the flaws of humans. So I think our flaws are more important than the, the quote unquote behavior finance. And where I'm going with all this, I swear I have a point, is that we as humans tend to view bad luck as just bad luck and not our fault, not necessarily something that we've done wrong or could have avoided. And we, on the flip side, we tend to view good luck as skill, and that's just one of our flaws. And the reason I say I want to study these further is I think that's it's, it's fodder for a lot of research and presentations, and it also, it also helps us to understand us and, and our flaws and how we're not made to trade. And I just think that's a, a, a good thing that should be studied. But you have to be really careful. Now, sometimes you just have bad luck. We've had two trades recently where they dumped, the company dumped shares onto the market. And I remember went in the house a few weeks back and I was down in the dumps and pissed off. I mean, I still have a pulse. I mean, I might seem kind of calm up here doing a presentation, but I told someone who's a possible partner in some business ventures, anyone that he's talking about come and visit me. And I was like, oh, no, you don't want to see the sausage get made, you know. So, yeah, I'm human, too. I'm dropping the F-bombs. And But I told I went in. And she's like, what's going on? Because, you know, your wife can read you better than anyone. I was like, ah, you know, these jerks dump some shares onto the market. The company decided to print some shares, which dilutes it for everyone else. And she's like, well, doesn't technical analysis, shouldn't technical analysis have told you that that was going to happen? It's like, oh, no, it's not quite that easy. And I didn't explain to her that it won't tell you everything. I mean, if it did, you don't know where, obviously, but it kind of groaned a little bit. But it happened. So we had two stocks recently where they dumped shares on the markets, and that added supply. What happens when supply comes in? Well, unless demand picks up, it's going to push your stock lower. So sometimes you will have bad luck, and sometimes you might have a string of bad luck. But recognize bad luck is bad luck and not something that you might have done wrong. Now, there's not enough time to get into it today. I, I just recently did some videos on this, and there's a lot of details to a postmortem. But let me see if I can give it to you in a nutshell. If you're doing a, an honest postmortem on a trade, then you're going to learn a lot about what's going on. And you need to ask yourself, did you pick the best stock to begin with? So after the trade is over with, even on good trades, do the same thing. I would encourage it. But back your chart out to the day of the trade and ask yourself, would you have taken this trade if you were just seeing it for the first time? What are the sector, what were the sectors doing? What were the stocks within the sector doing? Okay. Were there any sexy sisters or brothers within the sector that looked better than the stock you picked? Was the market trending? So ask yourself all these questions and if the stars wasn't, weren't lined up for all these things, then ask yourself, did you think you had the mother of all setups? And if you did, even if it didn't work out, then pat yourself on the back because you did the right thing. Now, Let's say you look at the markets and the markets still look pretty good, but you're in a drawdown and maybe you have a little bit of bad luck. And you did some postmortems and you went through all this process. 
is there something possibly outside of trading that could be affecting your trading? And it kind of reminds me of Spock when he, I guess he died and then they brought him back to life somehow. I know, yeah, right, huh? Like, <laughs> you ever be with someone watching SpongeBob and about halfway through they go, yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, I digress. We, we were, I, I'm going to digress further here. We, we were watching Cats and Dogs years ago with the family, and um, the dogs had on little uh, headsets and they were they had like secret hideouts and they were talking and everything and uh, and they were going after the cats and they had radars and stuff and and about 20 minutes in the video uh, a golden retriever jumped over hedges which were about seven feet high and my wife goes yeah right <laughs> like wait a minute the talking dogs didn't that wasn't enough to, to make you question this anyway a little uh, joke on her uh, expense but it reminds me, like, sometimes you're in a drawdown, you're kind of like Spock when he's relearning or making sure he learned everything he had to relearn coming back from the dead. And he's in front of these computers, these three computers, and they're just rapidly firing questions at him. And he's going on, he's answering, 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 answering. And so it's like you're in a drawdown, and you're like, you're just like sticking your head further and further, not up your rear, but <laughs> into your screens. And then you might just need to breathe. And like in the Spock example, the computer asked him, how do you feel on one of the screens? And this threw him because Spock likes to see himself as only a logical being because he sees himself as Vulcan. But his mother is human for all you Trekkie nerds out there. Well, you Trekkie nerds would know that. But for all you non-Trekkie nerds, I guess I'm somewhere in between. How do you feel? And that question really threw him. And that's what made him stop in his process and take a step back. Well, it's kind of a metaphor in trading. When you're in a drawdown and you're sticking your head further and further in those screens, just trying and trying and trying to make something happen, take a step back and ask yourself, how do you feel? Is there anything in your life that has nothing to do with trading that's affecting your trading. And if you've been to a few of these shows, you might recognize some of these slides. So is there something going on in your life that's causing some, is it strife? Would that be the word? I like that. A little, uh, little Johnny Cochran there. Is there something in your life that's causing some strife? that could have you performing at a less than optimal level. Now, along the lines of stop digging, you have to be careful not to try to trade yourself out of a drawdown, not to try to trade, not to try to force something happen. You have to, and, and that's where you're going to be most tempted like, oh, if I just, like, take some more trades, then I'm going to fix this. Well, the alligator syndrome is if you get, if an alligator begins to eat you, supposedly you just go limp and then the alligator gets tired of eating you and goes away and you live. Now, I live in South Louisiana. We occasionally even have an alligator in the front yard, so that might be not be exactly true. So let's not go too far there. The metaphor is there, though. So the more you wrestle, the quicker he's going to eat you, I suppose. So it's called alligator syndrome. Well, the same thing applies to trading. If you think you can trade yourself out of it, you know, market punches you, you got to punch back harder, maybe over leverage, maybe take less than mediocre, less than ideal condition. Uh, oh, Less than ideal setups, some mediocre setups is what I'm trying to say, and dig your way out of it. And 
if you're not careful, you could start changing rules. Now, I'm going to give you a link to an article in a few minutes that I wrote on how the absolute worst time to change a rule is during the heat of battle. And that's why I got Greg in my head today. That's why I keep mentioning him. But he, in investing with the trend, he talked about his flight simulator school where he'd be inside a simulator and they would try to trick him up and get their emotions going so they would change a rule and not follow the procedure. And he went on to say, and I don't have the exact quote in front of me, so I'll just have to paraphrase, but he went on to say that that's the absolute worst time to change rule is when something doesn't appear to be working right. The other problem, which is kind of a, a corollary to that or an offshoot to that, could be that you end up grail hunting and changing methodologies. Now, I don't want to go and spend too much time going into that because we could talk about that for a lot, a lot long time too. But the problem with changing a methodology is you'll end up perpetually out of phase. If you're a trend follower and the market's choppy, then you go to a choppy system, then all of a sudden the market's trending again. Then you end up with a drawdown from your choppy system, and then by the time you get into your trend system, then the market's choppy again. So I firmly believe you have to just do one thing and follow that one thing and get good at it, but keep it simple. So you have to be careful. Stop grail hunting. Don't change the rules. And don't try to dig your way out by making more trades. Now, don't stop treasure hunting. The next big winner that will save you could be just around the corner. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, I thought you said stop digging. Well, I'm saying take a breath, okay? Take a pause. And be super duper selective. You might start trading the next day. But be super duper selective. And I've borrowed this line from, I think it was in the first Market Wizards. You can't confuse intuition with intuition. Don't read into things too much. The, the market will come to you when the time is right. And I like to call it the can't stand it test. And my first experience with this was back, I think, probably in 2000 when I was working on my first book. And I was happened to be at a drawdown at the same time. And as I wrote, as I have written, I might even put it in the first book, that my trading wasn't going so hot, so I found myself backing off a little bit. Plus, I was so busy trying to get a book out. If you've ever written a book, it's it's just a, it's a killer. That's why I do one about every 10 years, so I'm probably five years away from doing another one, at least. But I backed off on my trading, and then something wonderful happened. I was still following the markets, obviously, but I reached a point where I saw some setups that I couldn't stand it. I felt like, wow, I have to take this setup. And not on all of them, but to my surprise, quite a few begin to work out very nicely. And then there's also another lesson there, too, where I didn't micromanage myself out of positions like I might have been tempted to do because I was so busy with everything else. And from that moment forward, by the way, I've kept myself busy to try to keep myself out of the micromanaging and only taking the best setups. So you want to wait for your can't stand it moment. Wait until you think you really have something special before you step back in. So it's a little bit, um, what's the word? It's a bit of a dilemma. You, you have to keep trading, and it's kind of like beating your head against a wall. It feels so good when you stop, right? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expect, expecting a different outcome. So it's almost like, why should you keep trading if you're trading into a hole? Well, if you become very selective, 
and you start identifying these things in your life and specifically the market or especially the market too then you'll find yourself backing off a little bit and only taking the best opportunities now I wanted to talk about this subject a few weeks back and I realized it's just such a massive subject that it's something I couldn't really cover on the fly so I've been kinda of collecting my thoughts over the past few weeks but there's still a lot of other things to cover here and you know the first thing that one of my peers asked me when I said ah, I'm bummed out I'm in a drawdown he's like well how normal is your drawdown well that is something that's actually nearly impossible to quantify because the combination of bad luck and then changing conditions etc you can't quantify exactly what that should be so but as a general statement, you do have a general feel for things. Yeah, you could get knocked out of a few of them, and then you have to dig yourself out of the hole. But that's one question you should ask. Now, going into a system, if you've never traded it before, if you're looking at something like longer-term trend following, then you know that those drawdowns are going to be abysmal. So it's almost like you can expect the occasional abysmal drawdown but the problem with with this business is that there are no guarantees you want to guarantee buy a toaster as I've written before and as others have written too I can't guarantee you that your drawdown won't be worse than next but I can guarantee you that if I hit a drawdown I'm going to become kind of crazy selective on the next trades that I put on doesn't mean that I won't put on a trade the next day but I'll become more and more selective and I will do everything that I talked about so far today and in doing such at the least that drawdown is going to begin to flatten out fairly quickly so if you think about it If you're not putting on, if you're in a drawdown, you're not putting on any new trades, then that drawdown curve will begin to flatten out. Yes, your open trades will could go against you, or as I said earlier, they might go for you. You might have one little outlier in there, which is going to save the day or certainly mitigate the losses. But as you become more selective, and if the market becomes choppy like this, then you're going to start going sideways and eventually when that market begins to trend up or down again then you're going to come out of the drawdown now you have to ask yourself do you have a lot of experience with the methodology and the more experience you have it never gets easy. It never, it never gets easy. So if you've been at this six weeks, six months, or even six years, and you hit a rough patch, which you will, not if, when, you'll think, geez, this is, this is tough. But as you go through more and more, it gets a little bit easier, and you're becoming a little bit more accepted of the fact that, there will be bad times. So the more experience you have, obviously, the better off you'll be. My ultimate goal, as I've talked about before, is to reach a point where I become completely flippant about my trades. And I guess as long as I'm a public figure in the trading world, that's going to be a little bit tougher because I will have clients reminding me when I suck. <laughs> but at some point, I like to reach a point where I become flippant and in this I know I don't know them personally but I know of some fund managers where they have people shield them from the client and if the client begins complaining uh, they've reached the point in their career where they say well cut them off I don't want to hear from them and the clients like no 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 no, 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 no I, I want to stay but you know he's like well quit bitching you know he doesn't let that interfere with his trading so again you have to reach a point where you get flip it and you can't you can't get egotistical like the 
the hedge fund guy I wrote about recently, Bill Ackman, and lose $4.1 billion on one trade. Obviously, something has gone awry there, okay? It's okay to have a slightly larger than normal loss on something due to a bit of obstinance, but at some point, you got to pull the plug at $1 billion, $2 billion, $3 billion, $4 billion, $4.1 billion, oh, that's enough, you know? Now, one thing I would recommend you do is I have an article called Your Trading Tre Checklist. That's what I was referring to earlier. And a lot of these things I talk about, talked about today are in that article. And just to save you from typing in that long URL, just go to my website and under search, put in the word checklist. And at least right now, the first article will come up about the checklist for trading. And I'd recommend it, strongly recommend that you read that. All right, any questions, any thoughts? Vacations are good. I actually didn't take a vacation, Howard. I took a vacation from the week of charts. <laughs> but yes, one day I will take a vacation. I'm, I'm doing a lot of studying on things of that nature. It helped make you more or less stressed. I didn't take a, I didn't take a break. I took, I brought a laptop with me for a weekend at the beach. <laughs> but that's okay. Okay. Once again, it's here. After two years, finally got it out. Trading full circle course, and you can start watching it for free. Just go to this link here and at least watch the base videos. Even though the base videos, there's a lot of good stuff in there, if I say so myself. And this is especially true when I put the quizzes together for it on getting your mentality right for the markets. And if you think about it, as I often preach and as I talk about in the first four videos, which again are free, I'd rather have someone with a good attitude than someone who's smart. If I were to teach someone or have a protege, however you want to look at it, to trade. And your attitude is important by embracing and accepting the way that markets work from a psychological aspect. And not enough time to get into all that, but the bottom line is Markets are often illogical and always irrational because you're dealing with the emotions of a lot of other people. Watch those videos and you'll see what I mean. All right, what else is happening? Still whirling at the learning management system, which Trading Full Circle is part of. And then um, free videos, obviously. And if you have any questions, David, DaveLander.com. Um, on my website... I talk about the delayed service here. Now, I haven't been updating it much. I've been kind of busy and I've been bad about updating it. Uh, what happens is the um, so sometimes we'll have an open position or open setup, I should say. And until that actually triggers, I can't update the delays. But I, I've, admittedly, I've been bad about doing that. But if you do go to my website and click on new to trading, there's a landry list of things to do. And one of them is, things are a little slow today for some reason, but one of them is the delayed service. And so that's where the link is now. And a few of you have been asking me where to get, get to the link. But if you come down here, Steps to Success. And there's plenty of free stuff here to keep you busy for a while, okay, long while. But uh, number nine, for those of you who are looking for that. So home site, click on that little new to trading thing, and then number nine will be right here. And then... Again, I haven't updated it much lately, but I will. I promise I will get back on top of that. All right, let's hop into the markets. If you guys want to start asking about individual stocks while I, I do a little thumbnail sketch of the markets, feel free to do so now, and then we'll, uh, we'll hop into your picks. All right, let's take a look at the P's. S&P 500 stuck in this little range in here. 
chopping sideways, okay? And just for SGs, let's throw in a 50-day moving average. Yeah, keep those picks coming. We'll get to them in a minute. It'd be, it'd be good to have several of them so we don't have an impasse when we get when we do get to the charts. And you can see we did come down to kiss that 50-day moving average and hopefully kiss it goodbye so far. As I say, kiss my goodbye, kiss the moving average goodbye. And you get back the chart out a little bit, and you see we've had a nice run, and then we kind of came down, consolidated towards that 50, tried to take off, came back, give it one more kiss, take off, and now back again to the 50 and coming out of that so far. Nothing magical about the 50. I do like to pull it up on occasion, and usually that occasion is when the market begins to crack a little bit, like recently, like right here. And usually you'll notice that a lot of times when the market is at an inflection point, a lot of technicals will come together at the same point. In this particular case, it had dipped down to the 50, and the 50 was also equal to what? The top of the prior trading range. Now, yesterday was a fantastic day, internally especially in the market, but even on the surface, you could see S&P was up about three quarters of a percent. And it's just shy of all time highs. Let's go ahead and measure that. So a third of a percent away. So one good afternoon and we would make new highs. Now new highs can often beget new highs because people who aren't always, always already long may be forced in. People who are waiting for the correction that never comes may be forced in. And sometimes that buying can beget more buying. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. NASDAQ had a decent day yesterday too, and it looked like it was beginning to break down just about a week or so ago. It looked pretty ugly. How's that for an oxymoron from a trend following moron? But now it's trying to get back to the top of its range. Now I wouldn't rush out and buy it. You know the routine, take things one day at a time, but it's certainly improving in here. Now, as earlier earlier I said net-net, and if you look at the pick your favorite index and the net-net, you can see you know, we have, what, a couple of months of sideways trading in here, so it hasn't made a whole lot of pro forward progress, but shorter term net-net, it's done okay. So I would encourage you to look at a variety of time frames. And one thing that I've done in the past which is kind of nerdy and fun, is to plot a few of these linear regression trend lines. Do maybe like a five-day, do like a 10-day, and then make them different colors. Is that, a, is that one? Let's see. Yeah, here's one. And then just to kind of give you a little perspective of what the market's doing. Now, I used to experiment a lot with that, and then I just kind of realized, well, I could just draw a line myself, and it pretty much tells me where the market is on a net-net basis. But it is something to play around with if you uh, are looking to do a little research. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Russell can't seem to get out of its own darn way. We dipped below the 50 recently, and so far that was just a little kiss. We came right back up. And yesterday, if it had closed on its highs, I know, big if, if my aunt had, yeah, it should be my uncle, I know that. Of course, nowadays, I guess it doesn't, a joke probably is not as, doesn't make as much sense, right? You get to pick your own gender. Anyway, I digress. Um, but today, you can see it's getting hit fairly hard, down about half of a percent. But this is sort of par for the course with the Rusty. It's just been chopping around in here. And again, the net net there, if we could back this chart out, the net net is fairly unchanged going all the way back to what? 2016. Not a whole lot of forward progress there. And this is a little bit more indicative of why it's been a little tougher to trade smaller cap issues in 2017. You look at the S&P 500 and it's mostly made new highs. It's had some pretty serious consolidations in between, and you're thinking, well, you're not beating the S&P 500. Well, the stocks that normally beat the S&P 500, as a general rule, 
haven't been beating the S and P 500. Now, the reason you want to trade these more volatile stocks because is because they're more inefficient and have the potential to make larger moves. And the only way you're going to beat a market longer term is with more inefficient stocks. You're going to you need stocks that are more volatile than the overall market if you're going to beat the market. But that's one of those things, like anything, that doesn't work all the time but does work over time. Now let's take a look at some of the sector action in here. Chemicals hit new highs just yesterday. Not that there's anything exciting you want to go after in the chemicals, but it did hit new highs. Energy still look fairly abysmal in here. Just draw some trend lines, however you want to draw them. Connect the dots. Look at your 50-day moving average. Whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. Now, metals and mining have been waking up nicely as of late. But I wouldn't run out and buy them just yet. Now, if they started making new highs for the year, I might consider it. But as I've been saying, especially to the, my peeps in the service, as a girl I dated many years ago, she'd say, if I had my rathers, if I had my rathers, I'd rather metals and mining go down and make these all-time lows, bottom out for six months, and then make the mother of all bow ties and fur thrusts and everything else, and we jump on and catch the next great bull market. But one day at a time, right now, I don't see any reason to rush out and do any trading in the metals. Now, maybe tonight, maybe next week, maybe two weeks from now, I might see a metal stock that looks absolutely fantastic, and I think it's worth a shot. And again, that's one of those can't stand it, if you think you have the mother of all setups. But as a general view, you know, as a view from 20,000 feet or what's whatever they're saying, yes, 50,000 feet, you probably don't want to be trading any metals just yet. Gold within the metals, as you can see, pretty choppy in here. Ideally, again, I'd love to see them come down here, take out the 2016 lows, and then bottom out. Maybe dip well below that, come back above that, bottom out, and then make some transitional setups. That'd be awesome. Some of these uh, conservative areas, if you want to call them that, or defensive areas like foods, look like they could be in trouble. And the bow tie is a little sloppy here, so that's not really helping you much. But you can see the bow ties have rolled over, okay? And just a blank chart, which I normally like to look at, you can see has pretty much headed lower and it's kind of pulled back a little bit. So it kind of has a first thrust type of look or maybe more accurately an inverted cup and handle look to it. Now, banks have been all over the place, but in recent times, and I've been calling for the mother of all tops in banks for about a year, not a year, but about uh, most of 2017, from let's say March on. And they haven't turned into the mother of all tops. So maybe they're, maybe they're not dead yet, like the, the guy in Monty Python. But I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet. Maybe if they continue to bang out new highs, it might be worthwhile. And this might have something to do with bond prices and I'm not a banker but maybe higher interest rates are good for banks I don't know I don't know how that works but maybe it's the spread or something they make I mean I try to avoid these fundamental things as you know but you can see that bonds have become a little questionable as of late bonds down rates up now as I often preach it's the the delta of the of the bonds that's important, the delta of the interest rates that's important. In other words, the change. So if you see a big jump in in rates, or a big increase, I should say, then that could spook the market. The absolute levels aren't really that important because the market really doesn't factor that in. There's no way to factor that into a formula. But a market will fear higher rates. And right now, bonds in general, as you can see, have been in a bit of a slide. They're getting hit fairly hard today. So that could be of some 
concern. You want to talk about solar before we get out of sector? Sure. Uh, solar sector has been doing fairly well as of late. This in spite of the energies. Now, if you look at solar's overall, and I'm looking at TAN, T-A-N, probably one of the best named ETFs out there. You have a lot of overhead supply to get through. Now, we could take a look at some individual issues here. Uh, you know, solar seems like one of those energies of a future stocks, and it always is. And I've had some people email me telling me how viable solar, solar is. I don't know. I know we did really well back in 2013 in solar stocks, but we're traders, okay? We're not trying to figure out if they're going to save the world or not. We just want to get on for the ride. Drugs have been shaping up as of late, but then they just kept pulling back recently, and they try to take off. Now they're coming back in a little bit. As a general statement, they still look okay, but we're just not seeing the follow-through. And that's one thing that's been kind of frustrating this year is some areas begin to take off, but we just don't see the follow-through. Biotech looks a little bit better than drugs, but obviously... I sure would like to see them start going up again with a nice breakout, little consolidation. And as long as the bottom of this consolidation holds, I wouldn't get too excited. But I'm cautiously optimistic here. I think biotech looks pretty good. Uh, health services just off of all-time highs, maybe losing a little momentum in here, but for the most part, looks pretty good. It's okay for them to come up, consolidate, and take off again. Some areas like the fence have been banging out new highs as of late. Transports have been begging on new highs, and you can see down a little bit today, but so far, nice persistent breakout remains intact, nice follow-through, so that's a good thing. Nothing magical about Dow Theory, but the more pieces of the puzzle that are positive, the better. So certainly that's a good thing that transports are headed higher. I, as I often preach, I'd rather just watch the semis, and the semis are coming back with a vengeance. Now, as I said recently, I'd be concerned if we took out the bottom of this little knockout, this little two-day knockout we had in here. Let's see if it looks what it looks like on a two-day chart. Yeah, it's a little bit more cleaner on a two-day chart. I'd be concerned if it took it out, but it really didn't take it out with a lot of vigor. And it didn't take out the prior knockout, which was back here. So, so far, the longer-term uptrend in semis is intact, but let's not start kissing each other just yet. It has a bit of a albeit maybe somewhat complex, meaning you have possible multiple shoulders, but it does have a bit of a head and shoulders look to it. And in order to negate that, it would have to take out the prior high. So semis are improving, but I'd feel a lot better if they'd make new highs in here. Software, another one of these areas that has worked back to its new highs, but given up a little bit. And as you can see, kind of a wide and loose, in a wide and loose range. But one big update, or one, if it just closed a tiny bit higher today, relative to yesterday's close, it would be at a new high, okay? All right, let's let's uh, let's start answering some of your stock questions in here. Hello, Hank. Welcome aboard. Looks like a new name. DLPH for Mr. Hank. Well, I would put that on your watch list. Um, it's a little wide and loose longer term. Volatility is okay at 30. Um, a lot of the stocks I like to trade usually have a little bit higher volatility, but I'll take stocks in the 30, 30s. Uh, by the way, this is 50-day historical volatility. If you have Metastock or Telechart, I have the formula for that. In fact, you can get the Metastock formula off the Internet. That's where I got it. And, and uh, But the Telechart stock uh, formula I modified, but it was originally off the Internet too. But anyway, uh, so far breaking out, put it on your watch list. I just would prefer if it had cleared these prior highs more decisively in here and then on a pullback. I mean, there's some other auto parts stores that are a little bit more trendy or have trended better and more cleanly. So I'd take a look, dig a little bit within that sector. ALB for Steve. And I know some of you guys are waiting patiently. We're going to get to you. Yeah, um, the only problem with this one is you have a bit of a v-shaped recovery and my problem with these v-shaped recoveries is that by the time the market gets all the way 
that to its new highs, it's already oversold. So you got a market that looks like this. It makes a V-shaped recovery. Well, right at these new highs, it's already over, I'm sorry, overbought. So let's take a look back at the chart. So what I would like to see this one do would be for it to continue to break out and then pull back before going after it, okay? Now, the other thing, too, is the HV is a little low, and it's a fairly thick stock. Not that I would rule out a stock just because it's, it's a higher in volume. But within the chemicals, let's just, let me just, let's just pop over to specialty chemicals. We have time. And let's, uh, let's sort them by volume so we can see the more. We want to see the ones that are more liquid. And obviously, there's some big ones in here. But maybe find something that's a little bit more inefficient and smaller cap to go after. And nothing's really jumping out of me just yet. Let's see. No, nothing, nothing yet. Looks like chemicals are a little choppy. But like anything, if you do like a stock, no matter what it is, pop it to the sector, or in this case a subsector, and see if you can find anything you like as much or better. Donald says, IWO, the Russell 2000 growth stock ETF, looks better than the IWM. All right. Yeah, uh, still pretty darn choppy, though. I mean, this is a, yeah, it's made some improvement in here, but, boy, that's just a gradual grind, and it's all over the place. But I hear you. Good, uh, good eye on that, Donald. Pierce, P-I-R-S. Yeah, this one I like. Um, this is a good-looking stock. It took off, and I didn't like the way it kind of stalled out a little bit, but now it sort of took off again. And I'd actually like to see a little bit more knockout move in here because look at the HV on this, 110. It's kind of like the opposite end of the extreme on that we're looking at with some of these stocks like that are down in the 20s and 30s. Um, but not too much more knockout move. You don't want to see it pull back all the way to its prior breakout. Okay? So... I would give this one a strong maybe. I'll have to take a look at it by the end of the day. But, boy, if it was down here a little bit closer to five, I would almost call that a textbook TKO. Now, this trend could have been a little bit more perfect, and I guess it could always be a little bit more perfect, in that if it could have been a nice persistent run from this base down here as opposed to this gap and then consolidation, kind of drifting and then drifting lower, then taking off again. But as a general statement, it sure looks pretty good. I, I have to, I'll go ahead and give you a high five on that one. But again, a tiny bit more knockout would be preferred. And if it did, close down a little bit closer to five. Entry above the high, stop below the low. Do the math on that. And that would give you your initial profit target. Joe wants to talk about UCTT. That was in the Landry list a while back. And... Had a pretty good run. Unfortunately, now it looks like it's in trouble. I wouldn't rush out and short it, but it does have that witch hat look to it, meaning that it sold off and then it had this like V-shaped recovery within a trend. So if anything, this would be a short but I think I would hold off shorting it. One, the market's not too far from all-time highs. Two, I don't think it's the mother of all shorts. I mean, I have like Tesla on my short list uh, for today. And I shouldn't be talking about it because it's on the Landry list. But you can see how, see how clean this is. you got a sharp thrust lower followed by a pullback as opposed to a bunch of days in the pullback. Now, if you were in a longer-term downtrend, and you had a witch hat. Let me see if I could draw it in. Then that's a different setup, okay? But you're more, you're closer to that transitional setup. In other words, you're just kind of rolling over. 
bow tie first thrusts, etc. So you want it to look a little bit more like this with only a few days of the pullback and a sharp thrust lower. Now, once you get into a longer-term downtrend, then yeah, I love witch hats. They can be a wonderful shorting pattern. But it's a trend resumption type of pattern as opposed to a trend transition type of pattern. So right now, if you wanted to short something, you'd want to look for something that looked more like this, like a first thrust or a bow tie off of these all-time highs. Grady's been waiting, waiting patiently for love. Let me give you some love, Grady. L-U-V. I'm actually going to be flying on love soon. <laughs> um, not by choice. <laughs> I have to help some family member out, and they sent me a ticket. So, all right, I'll give you a hand. Um, I digress. It looks okay. I, I'm not a big fan of airlines. My my airline trading system is wait till they go up and then short them, because <laughs> it doesn't seem like they can go up for long. But yeah, this one has done fairly well. HV is pretty low at 18, and my problem with low HV stocks is something bad could still happen. And there's not enough time to get into today, but let me just see if I could explain it quickly without a lot of detail. If you're trading a lower volatility stock, your stop is going to be smaller, STOP, but in doing such, your share size is going to be bigger to make the money management work. So your at-risk exposure is going to be larger and something bad could still happen. So this is my argument against trading lower volatility stocks. Not that I won't completely always ignore them. And by lower volatility, you can see it's, eight, it's HV of only 18, which is not much more than the market. And you can see that it's $62 round numbers a share, and then it was like $61, $1 back in June. So not a tremendous move in there, but something bad could still happen. TK is a first thrust. That's going to be a shipper, right? Now, some of these shippers have been waking up. I have one in my list for today. My problem with the shippers is they... Most all of them tend to have some overhead supply. Now, maybe that's a good problem to have. It gets up to this overhead supply. You'll be making enough money to where it doesn't matter. But, yeah, I hear you. It's It looks okay. It's kind of first thrusty looking. It's probably more of a bow tie. Um, yeah, it's sort of a bow tie. It's not properly formed. It's more of a first thrust. But, yeah, I'll give you credit for that as a as a, as a first thrust. So good eye on that one. I just don't think it's worth a trade because by the time you get in, it, you know, it's a, it's worth a swing trade. But with everything I do, I want to make sure I have the open-ended chance for a profit and not just a swing trade. So I like to have open air above. And if you go back to like the Kemet trade and you go back in time, you can see that there was clear sailing. Okay. Not that they won't always take off like this. I wish it did. Okay. But I don't want to have any problems to deal with in the trade. In other words, overhead supply. Now, there's nothing magical about overhead supply. It's just a place where people have likely done some trading and will be looking to get out of break even. Sam wants to talk about Pixie. Well, it's an IPO, and yeah, it has some breakout uh, characteristics to it. In fact, just for S and G's, remember I talked about, remember with the Snapchat, I talked about this at nauseum. I, I came up with a simple little system just to just to keep you out of trouble with a new IPO. And nope, not quite. I was, a, I was hoping it was a, it, it's one, it's set up, if it closes where it is today, it would be set up as a buy at B setup, which I haven't made public, which is in the IPO course. I was hoping it would also be this uh, moving average pattern, but it's not, so I can't mention that. But, yeah, that looks pretty good. Certainly worth putting on your watch list.
I grabbed the wrong window there. Sorry about that. Uh, goose, yeah, I would stay away from Goose now. Uh, now, IPOs do have what I call a first deep retracement, and that's a pattern that I don't actually trade, okay? But I think there's something there. So to answer your question, uh, no. I mean, uh, yeah, yes, the pullback's too deep, but sometimes, as mentioned, you do have a first deep retracement. you got too many days of the pullback also on a daily chart. But I hear you on a weekly, on a weekly basis. Yes, it is a first deep pullback. Uh, Donald, that one's on the Landry list, so we'll keep that off for now. CPRX. Uh, yeah, it looks kind of interesting. Let's see, good HV, good volume. Uh, it does have some issues way back here, but. That is way back there in 2015. I don't see a huge consolidation problem. Um, this is bothering me a little bit, this trading back here. And the reason it is is because markets do have long memories. But shorter term, I hear you. Shorter term, it looks okay. Um, I'd almost like to see a little bit more acceleration higher like this and then the knockout as opposed to this kind of Drifting action, takeoff, knockout, but it looks okay. And I can't fault you on that one for sure. ADOM. Long from the five day close. Good for you, Donald. Good for you. That's the uh, buy at B, right? Let's just put a moving average in there for S and G's. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's not really working out on that one. Um, yeah, take your partial profits, get that stop up to break even at the best, at, the, at least, and then enjoy the ride. CPRX, did we talk about that one? Yeah, we did. Or did we? That looks pretty interesting. Yeah, we talked about that one. It looks good. It's got the memories longer term, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I'll cover that one to death. TRVG for John. I'm going to take a stab at your name. Zaitansky. Is that right? Zaitansky. Uh, one thing that I'm seeing here is the net net problem. Now, it is still relatively a new issue, so sometimes new issues can do fairly well with breakout patterns, but it really has it clean, cleaned. It really has it Zytensky. Oh, it's easier than it looks. Okay, Zytensky. All right, I got you. Uh, it really has to clear this prior high decisively, so I would pass based on that. Wait for it to probe higher and then wait for a pullback. If you're long, stay long. That's pretty easy to pronounce. I could do that. Even my Cajun. D-O-V-A -D -O for Nate. Yeah, this one looks fantastic. Um, I prefer a little bit more knockout move, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a high five situation. Nice thrust higher, a little bit of a pullback. I'd almost like to see a little bit more, but with IPOs, you don't always get the perfection you want. So absolutely high five. Fantastic, Nate. Good eye on that one. I know a few Nates. Is this a Nate I know? <laughs> Good job. Susie wants to talk about MYO. Do I have that? MYO. It's not coming up. Oh, there it is. Um, my only problem with this one is sometimes you can have too much of a good thing. And as I talked about extensively in a stock selection course, and I think I talked about it, um, I also talked about it in Trading Full Circle, and I also talked about it in the free video on the Stock Selection Course page. But sometimes you get what I call a bottle rocket, where for you non-rednecks out there, a bottle rocket's this little firework you stick in a bottle and you light it, and it sounds like it's going to go to the moon, and all of a sudden just fizzles out and pops, and there's not much excitement. Um, 
I don't know what that goes too far. Talking about bottle rockets, but anyway, the stock ran up 200% round numbers, and then maybe 250% if you measure it to the highs. When something shoots up like that that quick, a lot of times it just goes right back in. So I would leave this one alone for now. I hear you. It's kind of like that first deep retracement I talk about, or we talked about earlier for sure. But I think I'd leave it alone for now. CLDR. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. That's a that's okay. Thanks for that update, Nate. Appreciate it. Um I'm okay with IPOs that take off and then go down and bottom out, bottom out and take off again. But in this case, it just looks like there's something wrong because you've got this big gap down. So I would wait. Well, first of all, you need a setup. So I'd wait for a setup, and then this would concern me, all this trading around 20 bucks a share because you might have some people looking to get off the hook there. So wait for a setup and then reconsider it. You're welcome. AYX. Well, it's thin. It's pretty thin. Uh, it has broken out, but I'd like to see it break out further and then pull back, okay? But yeah, put it on your watch list. It is a relatively new issue. Definitely put it on your watch list. If you were if you're trading, I bet let's put the five day let me see if I get this five day moving average thing to work. Yeah, it would have been a buy on that day on this oops. Would have been a buy on this oops, if I get everything to work here. On that close above the opening day high. Because the the high was set on the first day of trading. And I think this is one we've used an example quite bit, quite a bit. Your buy wouldn't be until it closed above that high, based on those breakout things. But yeah, I would let it break out further before getting too excited. All right, Jim wants to know about A L R N. Good to see you, Jim. Uh, the only issue here is you can see that the high was set on the first day of trading. So obviously, if you're trading a breakout system, which I'm not a big fan of breakout systems, by the way. If you're new to this, is this your first, if this is your first webinar, remember that I'm not a breakout guy. I'm a pullback guy. But in IPOs, I do make some exceptions. So in this particular case, I probably would only consider this one if it took out 14. And I don't know. I don't think I would trade the pullback just because of this first big wide range funky bar. I'd like to see that trading get out of the system by having it go on to make new highs. DVAX, overhead supply. Let's take a look at that. DVAX. Um, yeah, you answered your own question. And also, when they have a huge gap down, I'm just not a big fan. And this was like it gaps down, it gaps up, it gaps up. It's just kind of all over the place, Jackie Mason stock. But, yeah, you got a lot of overhead supply, and then you also have quite a few days in the pullback. I mean, I hear you. It's like it's taking off, it's pulling back. When you have winter, do you like to trail below two, below, two bars below? Um, no, because the problem with that is... John's question is, let's say you got a winning stock, and we'll come back to Kim, and he's like, do you want to trail at two bar stop? Well, the problem with that is, I mean, if you were doing like a, like a ultra short term swing trade thing, that might work. But let's say you're trailing at a two bar low, and remember, the ultimate goal is to A, get a swing trade, and B, Hold on for a longer term ride. Longer term trading is what? Too risky. Shorter term trading, less risky, but doesn't make enough. So you have this dilemma between the dichotomy of the two, if that makes sense. I'll try to use a four syllable word. Well, that's only three syllables. But anyway, so we had gotten in back here somewhere. So your first two bar low would have been like right there. So we'd have got in and got out at a loss as opposed to holding on for the biggest winner so far this year, okay? 
So what I would encourage you to do is two things. One, you want to be outside of the normal volatility of the stock. If the stock is bouncing around three and four and five points a day, you want to be outside of that volatility. Let's see where our stop was in that one, if it's not too much trouble. Let's see. So the stop on that one was where? 1.55 points away. So the stock was probably bouncing around a point or so a day. And back here, I looked at it as well, it's going to require about a one and a half point stop is what it determined. Now, sometimes if you have like a trend knockout move, you could have your stop in like this. You could have, this is what I call a textbook TKO. And if you go back a few weeks in the weekend charts, and of course it's in trading full circle too, soft sell there. Sometimes if you get a big enough knockout move, then this calculates your stop for you. You don't have to worry about the volatility as much. But you want to have your stop outside of the normal volatility. So if the normal volatility of a market, and I drew that poorly, let me try again. Let's say you've got like the, like if that represents volatility or noise, however you want to look at it, and let's say this is two to three points, well, your stop needs to be greater than three points, okay, to withstand that initial swing trade, okay? So in this particular case, we had 1.55. The idea was to survive the normal noise to get that swing trade out. And then you gradually let that stop and stop loosen up to ride out the longer term winner. So a two bar stop would have taken you out long before this thing ever become profitable, long before it ever became profitable as a swing trade even. JPM, it's probably a little too thick for me. Let's just see what's going on now. As a general statement, the thick, in other words, high volume stocks can offer opportunities more on the short side than the long side. Your HV is pretty low in here. I mean, if anything with this one, keep an eye out for when it does roll over. Watch for a bow tie or something and look to short it. But there's not going to be a huge opportunity as a general statement in, in a big, thick cap stock like this that's low in volatility. I mean, it's like $92 now. It was $92 way back in, in March. So I'd much rather trade something a little bit more um, sexier. FRTA. Uh, I've got a bad tick in there or something. Well, obviously, it's going to have the mother of all resistance up at 18, but that would be a good problem to have. You know, it's like, oh, geez, all of me was, what, 100% on the trade? Let's zoom in on this a little bit, see what we got going on. Um, I think it's got too many days at the pullback, but I hear what you're saying. Um, why am I getting such a funky chart on this one? I don't know what's going on. I must have a, there's a bad tick somewhere or something. Business associate was complaining about bad ticks. I mean, another guy, we're going <laughs> to take some ticks off the dog and send them to him. <laughs> Age doesn't guarantee maturity, as my wife often says. Yeah, this looks okay. Uh, HV pretty low at 19. Sometimes uh, persistency can drive HV a little lower, but you can see it's only made a couple of point move in like a month or so. Uh, maybe if it accelerates higher and maybe on a pullback, but I think I'd leave that alone and see if you can find something a little higher in volatility. Is this low volatility, Steve? There was a Steve a while back that liked the low volatility stocks. Which will which will work until it don't, and then you've got a, a big position on and you're hurting pop. That's fodder for another presentation. Um, not much of a breakout here to get excited about. It just kind of it broke out, but then 
it kind of came back to where it broke out. I, I just would like to see some acceleration. I mean, I hear you, though. It's in a longer-term uptrend, but I'd almost like to see it, or I would like to see it, make new highs and then pull back again. So put it on your momentum list, but don't do anything other than that. Uh, this one, it's not too, too thin. It's a little thinner. Uh, a lot of uh, bad memories way back here. You know, the only problem is when you see such a huge gap down like this and after stock was so much higher, there's likely some some overhead supply still in the market, people that are looking to get out just to improve their loss a little bit. So I think I would pass based on that. It's just it's just too crazy based on that. Uh, Jim, that one's on my watch list for today, so I can't talk about that. Thanks, Dave. You're consistent. This is why I like to bounce things off of you. Yeah, fantastic, Jim. Yeah, you know, and as I said before, I, I was part of a hedge fund at one point in time, and, and the way the partner described me is like, well, Dave's not always right, but he's always going to tell you what he thinks and why he thinks what he thinks. And he, he had a partner prior to me where the guy could never make a decision. Well, you just have to exercise that muscle, make decisions, but be consistent in your decision-making process. And, yeah, you're going to be wrong a lot. I wrote an article about myself, my favorite subject, of course. And the title of it was Often Wrong But Never in Doubt. And that's what, that's what everyone should be. You should never be in doubt. When you take a trade, you know what? I think I have something here that's worthwhile. You have to be either all in or out. And that's why you have to be sure of what you're doing and you have to be consistent, and that's important. That's why I try to be as consistent as possible. And, you know, the educational business has really helped me out here because it forces me to be consistent. And over the years, it's really helped me from a selfish standpoint to cement my methodology. Um, well, as you know, IPOs do have a breakout characteristic, Howard. So, yeah, I would wait for some sort of breakout. I mean, technically, you would be long. Well, technically, you wouldn't be long because there's a rule with buy it be that you don't buy above $20 a share. That's a caveat to it. So, um, but, yeah, let it see. Let's put it in moving averages for S&Gs. And then we got time for maybe one more after this, and I have to wrap it up. Yeah, that's going to be, if it closed, it was technically, it was a buy based on the little moving average system yesterday. So a re-trigger would be a close above yesterday's close. But I would just, for now, I'd put that in my watch list. And then last one. Yeah, this one has improved quite a bit. Um, let it get out of this range, okay? It's got it's in this big, stupid, longer-term range. So check back with me when it's up here. If you like it, put it in your watch list. When it gets above whatever this number is, let's say 33 or so, then maybe reconsider it. But let it get out of this range before taking the trade, or considering the trade, I should say. All right, I think, that's, uh, I think we're out of time. I appreciate you guys and girls being here. Thanks so much for coming. I'm obviously humbled by your presence, and I obviously enjoy doing these things. It's the highlight of my week. So thanks so much. Uh, any unanswered questions, David, Dave, Lander.com. Everyone have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk between now and then, and I guess I'll see you guys and girls again next Thursday. Thanks so much. You're welcome, Jim, Nate, Howard.